have a very little time with Mr. Irvin Waldman all the way from Israel tonight. He's going to talk about the tragic emasculation of British osteopathy. Uh, Mervyn is a graduate of Econ, and spent the last 20 years working at the bedside, hospital bedside in Israel. And he's here tonight to talk about the legacy of osteopathy. So please give a warm welcome to Mervyn Waldman. One small correction, I haven't come all the way from Israel just for you. <laughs> it's a contentious title. It's probably what's drawn the crowds. What I have to say is spoken from the heart and very much based upon the past 20 years that I've been working half the week in one of two hospitals in Jerusalem or now in the north where I live, the other half of the week in private practice. And what I've tried to do is both amaze you with the remarkable insights of the founders of our profession and amaze you because those insights seem to be as up-to-date as can be in terms of modern science, in terms of some of the very first efforts by the profession, particularly in America, to go back to researching with all the tools of modern research, whether these claims and these uh, suggestions are in fact valid scientifically. If, by the end of this evening, I've done only one thing, which is to excite your interest in going back to the roots of this profession, then it will have been worthwhile coming. You may disagree with me, um, but if, if you are excited, nevertheless, by the possibility that there's a lot more to osteopathy than what is being done in Britain today, a lot more at the hospital bedside and at the home bedside with seriously sick patients, sick people, acutely sick sometimes. But they could be your family, they could be your children if you have children, they could be your parents if you have parents or grandparents, they could be your spouse. Everyday run-of-the-mill illnesses that osteopathy, it seems, can help, then if you are excited by that possibility, then you will have begun a fascinating road in terms of reading, studying, seeing the few operators that are, are growing in number, that are still practicing what the founders of this profession practiced and made its name. Osteopathy grew exponentially in America in the first 50 years. It, it, it took off like a rocket, as few professions ever did. But why? Because its results proved itself. But what results? And with what kind of cases? Of course there were orthopedic cases. Of course there was the back pain and the neck pain. But they were relatively small in number when you look at the case histories in the libraries of the, of the uh, lecturers and faculties of the early osteopathic schools and hospitals. The name of osteopathy grew out of its ability to treat seriously sick patients before the era of antibiotics and before the era of steroids. Now either they were complete liars when they were suggesting that they were getting good results, or the fact that hospital after hospital opened in America, osteopathic hospital filled to the brim with patients who wanted something other than the heroic measures that were being practiced in those days in orthodox medicine, suggests that they weren't just shooting their heads off. Suggests that something was going on that was quite remarkable. And that we seem to have dropped, forgotten, neglected, avoided, perhaps. So let's dive in. Still based his life work on two 
fundamental principles. His whole life's work, I think, can be summed up by two <coughs> fundamental principles. That there is often a somatic component to disease. That there is often a somatic component to disease. Whether it's your child running an ear infection, or your wife who's got the flu, or your granddad who's got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, there is often a somatic component to the disease. And secondly, that the effective manual treatment of the somatic component to disease, the effective manual treatment of that somatic component, may play a significant role in enhancing the body's immune response and recovery from disease. Those were the two fundamental principles that moved Still and his early colleagues to develop the art and science of osteopathy. It took a little under a century after Still founded the first osteopathic hospital for the British Medical Journal to see fit to publish in July 1985 the results of an osteopathic trial regarding myocardial infarction. It confirmed the first of Still's fundamental principles that there is often a somatic component to disease. That's a copy of that first page of that article in our BMJ. Turn off where it comes. <laughs> Striking, eh? BMJ, 1985. Just a quick look at what they actually did. It's, it's a serious piece of research. The BMJ doesn't publish anything and everything. Some 62 patients were randomized. 62 is a good number, statistically. To be seen by some eight osteopathic physicians for palpation of the thoracic T1 to T8 paravertebral soft tissue. 25 patients had clinically confirmed myocardial infarction. Of the remainder, 22 were without known cardiovascular disease. They served as the controls. And 15, the remaining 15, were placed in an excluded group because they had diagnosed cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease other than myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction patients, 22 without cardiovascular disease, and 15 who had another kind of cardiovascular disease other than myocardial infarction. Examination of both the group with the myocardial infarction as well as the group with the cardiovascular disease other than myocardial infarction disclosed significantly higher incidence of soft tissue changes confined almost entirely to the upper four thoracic levels compared to the control group which was found to have a very low incidence of palpable changes throughout the thoracic dorsum, uniformly distributed from T1 to T8. So myocardial infarction patients, plus other cardiovascular patients, had clearly defined somatic palpable changes from T1 to T8, confirmed by eight different physicians. So there was intra-examiner um, reliability, and inter-examiner reliability of a very high standard, which is often very rare in osteopathic research. What were these changes? What did they actually feel? What could they diagnose and, and confirm one physician with the other? They were familiar characteristics that you're familiar with in, 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 in examining minor orthopedic patients. Increased firmness of the soft tissues, increased warmth, between T1 and 4, a ropiness, a feel of a ropey feel to the soft tissues, edematous changes, and a heavier musculature. The results 
of this publication in so august a medical journal should have sent shockwaves throughout the British osteopathic profession and its schools of training. It should have obligated, I believe, the profession to undertake a deep soul-searching as to why for some four decades since the end of World War II, British osteopathy and, it expo and its exponents, with a few brave exceptions, had all but abandoned the <coughs> clinic and bedside treatment of the truly ill, confining itself instead to minor orthopedics, almost indistinguishable from chiropractors or physiotherapists trained in manipulation. Students should have been up in arms when this was published, demanding from their respective faculties reinstatement of training in the field of osteopathic medicine, drawing on the wealth of texts, documented clinical data, and treatment protocols, gathering dust, or on the point of being shredded, in the British College Libraries and American <laughs> Hospital archives. Tragically, tragically, however, one could have heard a pin drop for the distension or debate that followed on the heels of this publication. You could have heard a pin drop. To the best of my knowledge, no revision of college clinical training was ever instated, and neither a single student dissertation nor professional trial ever attempted to confirm or refute the BMJ findings using a larger cohort and on a variety of different diseases. Nothing. If the results of such further trials had confirmed the original finding regarding the existence of a somatic component to disease, it could have led to a profound reassessment of the value of the osteopathic profession. It would surely have led to research into Still's second groundbreaking premise, that um, the viscerally and somatically related components in various diseases are to be regarded as integral parts of the pathophysiology and are not to be ignored during the clinical management of the patient. Furthermore, that the effective manual treatment of the somatic component of disease may play a significant part, a significant role in enhancing the body's immune response and recovery. It has taken a further two decades since that trial for a second trial of the same sort of kind to have been undertaken. And it's one that was published just a few years ago, we'll look at it in a moment, in 2007, from the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine under the aegis of uh, one of the great current osteopathic research workers called Licciardoni only fellow to have put osteopathy on the map in recent decades through his meta-analysis of uh, low back pain. And he's conducted, or he conducted a case control study of the osteopathic palpatory findings in type 2 diabetes mellitus. And its results were published in 2007. 92 subjects were recruited, good number 92, and statistically significant finding was the consistent association with tissue changes at T11 to T12 on the right side. T11 to 12 right side consistently came up um, in patients with diabetes mellitus type 2. Now look at this. Three years ago, Licciardoni went on to call on the profession to rediscover the classical osteopathic literature to advance contemporary patient-orientated research. He said, go back to the sources. Find out what the hell they were doing, because so far every indication is that they were telling the truth. And he's begun slowly and quietly to, to do so. I don't know whether anyone else else is listening to him, but he made this call loudly and clearly. 
Osteopathic investigators would be well served to rediscover the classic osteopathic literature to help advance current research. Now there has been a reflection on this call. There have been people listening. There's a growing number of trials being conducted and having been conducted in recent years investigating the effect of the treatment of the somatic component of disease. The second of Still's principle that actually, if, if you actually treat that component, something may happen to speed the recovery of the patient. Now, many of these trials are still somewhat underpowered and in need of methodological improvement. <coughs> Nevertheless, they are often positive preliminary results and clinical implications should once more have rudely shaken the British osteopathic establishment from its slumbers and had osteopathic students out on the streets demanding demanding a thorough reform of the teaching syllabi. So, I'd like to spend a few moments with you just reviewing some of these latest trials as their range and variety reflect a remarkable um, picture of pathophysiological mechanisms. For example, in 2003, the archives of the of the Archives of Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine Journal, which is one of the most highly respected journals in that field, published a study of the positive results of osteopathic manipulative treatment in addition to uh, standard treatment uh, in the pediatric, pediatric care in children suffering recurrent otitis media. Conclusions were that the results of this study suggest a potential benefit of osteopathic manipulative treatment as a juvent as, as a juvent therapy in children with recurrent um, otitis media, acute otitis media, and it may prevent the addition of osteopathy or decrease surgical intervention or antibiotic overuse. Now, I treat recurrent and acute uh, otitis media frequently in private practice, not in the hospital. In the hospital I specialize in pain medicine, but now, the first 10 years I saw them in hospital too, in, in the other hospital where I first worked, but now it tends to be only in private practice. And so far, the past two years, about, about eight to 10 cases, I can only remember one case where I asked the mother to take the child to the family physician with a note from me uh, saying that it's advisable to also have antibiotic treatment. A great many ear infections are viral anyway. But there's a possibility of um, opportunist infections developing and I felt in one case that that was necessary. But even there, the osteopathic treatment continued. The mother saw that the child's pain was reduced, if nothing else, by the treatment. And it's a very painful condition, as most of you know. 2010, osteopathic manipulative treatment and pneumonia. A randomized controlled trial was conducted to determine the efficiency or the efficacy of the treatment. Again, in addition to conventional treatment, for hospitalized patients with pneumonia and had a positive outcome. Significant reduction in length of stay, the duration of the intravenous antibiotics was also reduced and respiratory failure or death when treatment, osteopathic treatment, was compared to conventional care was far better. Given the prevalence of pneumonia, the use of, in addition, osteopathic treatment merits further study. Pneumonia. Could be your child going down with pneumonia. Could be very much more frequently your grandparents. Certainly, our grandparents were inevitably smokers and the statistics um, for Western European countries of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is very high because of the historical background of, uh, of uh, lifestyle habits such as smoking in more elderly population. And pneumonia is one of the big um, opportunist infections that anyone with emphysema or bronchitis is likely to suffer. And it could be your grandparents your parents. 
So even if you never want to see a patient other than with a minor orthopedic problem, are you going to deny your parents, your grandparents, the opportunity of doing what these people are doing in the research trials? Or are you going to turn around and say, well, you know, osteopathy's got nothing to do with that sort of problem? Not if you've got a conscience. Hopefully some of you are getting angry, not at me. Hopefully some of you are beginning to have the youthful, righteous anger that comes with youth. When something isn't right, when something isn't being told to you, that should be told to you. I never thought I'd be allowed to give this lecture here, by the way, today. I know it's another story. What do you actually do on the table? What do I do when I'm treating patients with these conditions? Let's just have a look, to have a break from all these uh, research statistics and, and details. Let's have some nice pictures. Do you want to turn the lights off? Leave the shirt on, actually, because the uh, patients are in their pajamas anyway. So. Just in case I need you for a moment. Here are some of the most classic treatment protocols that are used in treating, for example, pneumonia. This particular maneuver was known as the osteopathic lifesaver. It was known as the osteopathic lifesaver, not for any ridiculous reason, for the fact that its effects seem to be so valuable in the treatment of um, pulmonary disease and other conditions but particularly pulmonary disease, like pneumonia. Okay. Anyone know what I'm doing there? Is anyone familiar with this? God, you should be angry. Bloody hell, I'd be boiling. This is something that saved lives. And all of you can do it after a bit of training. Like six or seven years. No. <laughs> ben, now, don't tell me none of you can do what I'm going to do now. Okay? Make yourself comfortable on your back. It's hard work for the operator, particularly when it's a, a home bed that isn't your height, particularly when you can't get to the patient very easily, particularly when there are, in a hospital, lifelines often if the patient is seriously ill, you've got to get around all these drips. Now, my underhand is catching hold of the rib angles. What is just underneath the rib angles, by the way? Yes, the sympathetic chain. Your sympathetic ganglionic chain is right underneath those ribs that you are going to mobilize. The upper hand has to be directed over the, directly over the same ribs as the, as the lower hand is grasping. And you begin what is a mixture of mobilization and pump. I wonder if any of you can see the small pump I'm beginning to introduce through my theta and hypothenar elements. This table is sliding. Why is this table sliding? <laughs> I move down. Lower hand is grasping fourth to sixth to eighth, no, four to about seven ribs, seventh rib. Upper hand, meeting that pressure from below, and moving up with it. That is what that osteopathic lifesaver looks like. Ben, just sit up a second. You're eloquent enough. Just, just tell them what you felt, if anything. What was going on there? In most general terms, just hard, soft, rhythmic, arrhythmic. It's very soft, it was rhythmic, it was quite comfortable. Sorry? It was soft, it was comfortable, it, it, it was quite soothing. Um, and and it, it just felt nice. Was it superficial or was it deep? Let us give me the right answer. <laughs> well, I would have said both. Was it invasive? 
No, not at all. So somehow it's got to be effective but not invasive. It's got to be deep, but it mustn't hurt. It's all the art of osteopathy. It's got to be behind the science of what's going on there. Now, we could talk all day about what's going on physiologically or what you're trying to produce physiologically. And if you turn up to the lecture tomorrow, you'll hear all about it. But it's just me out of it. Um, that's what it looks like. Splenic pump. Similar maneuver directed over the spleen itself. One of the most important maneuvers, and we'll look at some research in a few moments on this, as to what it does to the white blood cell count for hours afterwards. I'm working damn hard. It looked easy, I hope, because you know, good osteopathy should look easy, just like good piano playing or violin playing should look easy. But it's hard work physically. You have to work. It's not tickling. There's another very important maneuver done at the hospital bedside in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or in pneumonia if the patient is not too unwell. The patient's grasping me around the waist. I can introduce traction and change the range of excursion of the diaphragm considerably in the course of this maneuver that lasts no more than 45 seconds to a minute. I can work from rib to rib focusing on wherever I find any somatic dysfunction, any somatic component that may play a part in this particular disease, and try to improve that dysfunction. That's the doming stage. As you press and encourage the outward breath, the diaphragm domes that much more as you help it on its way by that pressure as the patient breathes out. I thought I'd show you some bedside pictures. What is actually done? This is a very sick patient. Um, she has chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. You can see that she looks very unwell. She was running a temperature. You have to learn how to work through bedclothes, through, um, through pajamas, because one of the dangers is, is chilling. The patient muscles suddenly start to chill when, there are so, when they're so weak and their reserves are so low. And here the maneuver is again one that all of you can do, but is particularly suited to the bedside, where I have to sit by the bedside to bring myself down to the level of the patient. And perhaps, Ben, again, I'm sorry, just be a model for a moment, but I'll show it to you while I'm standing. But it's, it's a maneuver that you can all perform. It's nothing too difficult. My lower hand, once again, grasps the relevant rib angles that I want either below the rib shaft or above, depending if I want to pull down or stretch upwards. And the upper hand is the lever hand. The lower hand is my fulcrum. I usually be sitting by the bedside. And you can do this sitting very comfortably. And it's very powerful. Now, what I did to Ben earlier, and what I'm doing to him now, it's being done on a healthy model, someone who's not unwell. When you are ill, when you're running a tent, or when you're in acute pain, thanks Ben, your body is hypersensitive. Hypersensitive. The moment there's a degree rise in centigrade, you don't want noise around you. You can't stand noise as you lie down in your bed suffering. You don't want bright lights. You want it dark and quiet. And you want to be handled in a quiet and precise and minimal way. So you've got to be focused. You've got to know how to put your hands on the patient. Get in, do the work, and yet not irritate them even more. In just the same way uh, as, uh, as uh, they don't want to be disturbed with light and noise. If you do too much, if you do it too roughly, you make the patient worse. Um, to 
this day, I will always feel somewhat guilty because in my early years in Israel, I had a good friend who contracted um, pneumonia. He wasn't young anymore. He wasn't well. And I went to his bedside to help him. And I didn't realize that he was dying. Um, he also didn't want to go into hospital for further investigation. But I couldn't deny him treatment. Did the kind of work you're seeing here. And here. Saw him daily for three days. Sorry, saw him daily for three days. After the first treatment, it's the second day I went round, and the third day I went round, he begged me not to treat him again. <coughs> Because that first treatment so exhausted him, I'd overdone it in my enthusiasm, in my concern to help him. I'd overdone it, and he felt so much weaker, so much, and I saw it, I saw the result. And I probably speeded up his, his death, because he died within five days of that first visit, five or six days. He may have lived a few more days, but I exhausted his limited reserves. Because everything you do to a patient, every time you touch a patient, it has to be incorporated by the body of that patient, that mechanical activity that you've performed on them. It's not a dead plank of wood. It's a living cellular organism that has to incorporate what is, in fact, in modern terminology, mechanotransduction on a cellular level, and that takes energy to do so. Any change in the body takes energy. And the limited reserves just often do not have the ability to take too much of an affluent input. The second picture is a picture that's important because of the research we're going to see in a few moments, where both the spleen and the liver are being pumped at the same time. And There are times you cannot pump the thoracic cage. The patient is with lifelines, or the disease is too uncomfortable for them to have any pressure on the, on the thorax. But you still want to produce a powerful lymphatic flow through the thoracic field. Or you still want to get a powerful splenic response in terms of white blood cell count. This maneuver is particularly useful then. The knees are raised if possible because it's easier to get a fingers and thumbs in. It's always the whole of the hand. Take over the patient's breathing. It's short gasps if they let you, if they're relaxed. And when they're ill, they're usually quite relaxed. They just haven't got the energy to, to oppose. My body weight is doing the movement, not my hands very much. My hands are quiet and easy, so as not to make it uncomfortable for the patient. depth is determined by the resistance under my fingers. I have no idea how far to go until I actually feel the resistance as I apply my pressure. And that also determines the rhythm. I can't determine the rhythm beforehand. The rhythm is determined by where the resistance is met and therefore where I come off the pressure. And you might want to keep this up for a minute, a minute and a half. You have to be comfortable in your own body when you do this, otherwise you can't. patient's very ill. What is done on a healthy individual and feels like nothing special is a different scenario when the body is primed. Okay. Some more maneuvers. You see, when you're working at the bedside, you've got to learn many, many techniques that you will never have seen in your normal technique instruction. How do you treat a patient on a soft bed when there's no resistance to your pressures because of the softness of the mattress? Well, you take the, the, the patient. Okay. It's still on the table there, I think. Sorry about that. Hang on, I think I've got a spare laser. Right. Um, yeah. I'll give you one of one. I've got a spare one. 
So you take the patient off the, t off the bed, half off the bed, the legs are still in the bed, you put a cushion on your lap, you put a cushion under the head, and you get your hands underneath, the patient's on your lap, there's the patient lying on my lap, your hands are underneath, if you raise one leg up, you reduce the rotation, if you raise the other leg up, you reduce the rotation in the other direction, and your hands can, can increase extension or flexion. <coughs> literally can work your way down the whole thoracic and part of the lumbar spine, introducing extension, flexion, and rotation, and some side bending too. You work on each rib if you wish, individually. Just by doing that. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry. Okay. There's the Splenic pump. Sorry, yes, it's splenic pump. Another version of what we saw by doing on the bed. There I just mentioned how prime the body is when it is uh, running an infection. Whenever there is an infection, when there, sorry, whenever there is a rise in temperature, it inevitably activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and the locus coeruleus norepinephrine. Uh, sympathetic center in the medulla. It explains a lot of the symptoms of sickness. It's a sympathetic central facilitation that's going on. Priming the response of the body results in hypersensitivity to all afferent stimuli. White lights and so on, as well as manual intervention. This condition of hyperphysiology as the temperature rises, for example, includes upgraded nociceptor responses. Pain is that much more likely to be felt and produced by your handling of the patient if you're not handling them properly. But it also includes upgraded somatovisceral reflexes. So you can produce effects on a healthy sick patient that you can't produce on a healthy individual. Because on a healthy individual, the body has natural dampening mechanisms. It wants to keep everything stable. Afferent input, whether it's lights or, or noise or a hand, are dampened by the healthy body to maintain its equilibrium, which is healthy in that moment. When unwell, the whole sympathetic nervous system is on edge. And any input becomes um, one that can produce a physiological response. What it does mean, therefore, is that heavy treatment or heavy touch is always contraindicated. It's not often you can actually say always in life. But I think you can say it in this circumstance. When you have an acute patient, a sick patient, heavy treatment or heavy touch is contraindicated. The treatment must be gentle, sedative, minimally invasive, analgesic, and a very short exposure time to avoid exhausting the patient. This is, as I said just earlier, every treatment to be incorporated by the patient, sorry, it has to be incorporated by the patient, and to do so involves energy expenditure drawn from limited body reserves. It was a nice piece of research. Um, done in 1998. Another study showing the effect of osteopathic treatment on the length of hospitalization for pancreatitis, a very serious disease, which showed significant reduction of time in the hospital. Now, they've begun to study the effects of osteopathic techniques in the treatment of infectious diseases uh, and have done so once more on animals. They've gone back 100 years because almost exactly a century after similar trials on animals were conducted by the founder of this school, by Littlejohn, and his close colleague McConnell, and later on by Burns in Kirksville and in Chicago, are now being done again. For example, a very respected journal um, uh, regarding um, studies in the lymphatic system published this in 2007, just a few years ago. 
study on dogs, demonstrating the effect of the abdominal lymphatic pump, like I was doing on bed just a few minutes ago, to increase the thoracic lymph flow and white blood cell count. Conclusions that that pump alone, not doing anything else, just the pump alone, significantly increased both thoracic duct lymph flow and leukocyte count so that lymph leukocyte flux was markedly enhanced. It increased the mobilization of immune cells and is a likely and important mechanism responsible for the enhanced immunity and recovery from infection of patients treated with this pump technique. And there it is. You saw me doing it on bed. You can do it on a dog. But at least on a dog, you have a less of a chance of it being a placebo effect. Not entirely, but less of a chance. Now, the lymphatic pump technique significantly increases lymph flow and leukocytes in both the mesenteric and the thoracic um, duct lymph. And um, another study was done. Another well, study was done recently. Oh, I've got an idea. I put it through the hole. I'll close the hole. Just look at this for a moment. This was done just a year ago. Same journal, very respectable journal. And again, done on animals, on dogs. And this increased mobilization of uh, immune cells demonstrated in this trial and the one before it that we showed is a likely and important mechanism responsible for the enhanced immunity and not infrequent recovery from infection of patients treated with similar lymphatic pump techniques by those proficient in its use clinically. Let's look at a few more pictures. There I'm doing something that's similar to what was done in that trial. Instead of it being a pump, it's actually using the leg leverages to mobilize the gut wall in which there are a major um, quantity of lymph um, glands. What are they called in the gut? Does anyone remember? Payers patches? I mean, no? So much for physiology in the DSO. Sorry about that. Um, ben, get on the table, I'll say. Knees up. There, your lever. Two levers. Actually catch the gut with your finger on one side or your thumb on the other. Literally articulate the gut wall. go in very deep. And that mobilization procedure, according to the research, significantly increases white blood cell count and lymph flow in the abdominal lymphatic ducts and the thoracic inlet up there. This is 100-year-old techniques, 100 and more, 120-year-old techniques. It's as relevant today as it ever was. <coughs> Thoracic pump techniques, particularly important, particularly in children. There it is. That's my son, quite a few years ago. And he's had his range of infections and diseases. He's never had antibiotics, I'm glad to say. I mean, he might have needed it, but we've managed to see him through all the infections of childhood. Uh, he's had quite a few without antibiotics. And there's that thoracic pump. What's underneath my fingers? It's a giveaway, I'm telling you on that, on that uh, title. The thymus is right underneath those fingers. Right then, it's a very important gland in the child and in the infant. It's extremely active in terms of T antibodies. 
production of tea antibodies. It's there. It's waiting for your fingers. The same fingers you use in treating a low back. But it's been denied to you. <coughs> There's a lymphatic pump. Uh, the uh, splenic pump in a child. It's a different rhythm in a child. Still, Middle John, the founder of the school, were extremely busy on the cranium. Cranial technique didn't come out of the sky like a, like a, a Sputnik from outer space, or like a Martian that suddenly appeared. There's always something in the environment before some great individual comes along with some interesting ideas. And cranial work is part of osteopathy from the very beginning. Of course they treated the cranium. How else do you treat ear, eye, nose, and throat infections? How else do you treat headaches if you don't include the cranium? How else do you treat what killed three of Still's children, meningitis? <coughs> and there's some work on the cranium in terms of trying to drain um, in that particular in the case of my child was, if I remember, had sinus infection or an ear infection. I can't remember which. <coughs> to those infections. The upper neck, of course, was extremely important. Not in isolation. The rest of the body had to be looked at as well. But osteopathically, time and time again, certain centers in the spine, they don't have to be directly related in terms of neuroanatomy, but time and again they seem to crop up as the somatic component of the disease. And there is a particularly wonderful maneuver. That's Stills' maneuver. He called it the spinal switch maneuver where you use the two legs as a lever. I wish we could do that with adults. I do sometimes call a nurse in or a colleague to help me with certain adults uh, if I want to use that maneuver, because it's obviously too heavy for me to pick up two legs at one time. But in a child, it's just waiting for you. And you've got the whole thoracic and lumbar spine under your other hand as a fulcrum, literally catching hold of the vertebrae from articular process to articular process with the spinous process in between, between your thumb and the border of your first finger, literally catching hold of the, the vertebrae while you use the legs as a lever to switch vertebra after vertebra up to your fixed point. And you can go one by one, focusing on wherever the somatic dysfunction has been found. Done rhythmically, slowly, oscillatory maneuver. All the maneuvers are oscillatory. There's a gentleman who thinks he's discovered oscillation in this country, and I just can't understand it. I just cannot understand it. 2 to 14. <coughs> Crops up time and again as a most important center for the balance of deep and superficial circulation. You see, time and again, if my son was suffering, potentially suffering pneumonia, one of the most important things you can do in your treatment is to try to draw the deep hyperemia in the lung pulmonary field that surrounds the inflammation and the infection to the surface, to get an exchange of deep and superficial circulations, to get a rapid blood flow, a fresh arterial blood flow through the lung field, if you can, and to keep it going for a few hours to see them through the, the peak of the infection. And 2 to 4 T comes up time and again clinically as a key center in the control of the deep and superficial circulations throughout the body, not just the lung field. And you'll find, you'll find that it's hypersensitive. Or you'll find those changes that were in that VMG article of ropiness or thickness or edema or warmth there compared to other areas below or above. It's there if you look for it. There's a thoracic pump. When you're treating an infant or child, you might want to use anything. I'm using a, a lounge table to have a, a firm surface beneath me. Now, it's summertime, and in Israel, you don't have to wear clothes in summer. Um, but normally, all this has to be done through bedclothes, through pajamas. Back to the acute bedside. You may be only able to do that because the patient is so ill. Just deep inhibition of the erector spinae, deep relaxation of the erector spinae in those areas that you find the somatic dysfunction. You might be able to do nothing else. And there I'm sitting, because again, the bed is so low, and my elbows are on my thighs to give me support and so that I don't tire too quickly. So you have to adapt all the time your techniques to what's uh, in front of you. Is 
the writing very small for you at the back? Okay, that's young eyes for you. Critically important work when you're treating any upper respiratory tract infection, eye, ear, nose, throat, is to try to remove any myofascial compromise in the anterior throat. All the drainage of the lymph glands, all the drainage of the lymphatic system from the cranium has to pass down lymphatic vessels of the throat to get into the thoracic inlet, just below the clavicle. And so your work in the anterior throat is some of the most important and delicate that you can ever do. Now just imagine that on an infant, an infant that's got an ear infection or a nose infection. There's the size of your hand. There's the size of an infant's throat in terms of length and in terms of width. It's about that big. Somehow you've got to get your fingers in there and still do the work. It's not easy. Very challenging. So might as well start with adults. You know, when I first saw these tables with holes in them, I didn't see, you know, a traditional osteopathic table doesn't have all these holes in it and stuff. Like that. I thought, is it for incontinent patients? <laughs> <laughs> what am I searching for? What structure am I first interested in when I put my hands on the throat? Good. Why the hyoid? Well, just think of the mass of structures that are attached to the hyoid. That's why we're called osteopaths. We grab hold of bones because everything's ultimately attached to a bone. That's why they're called osteopaths, by the way. Because ultimately everything is attached to a bone. And in the throat, a hell of a lot of structures are attached to the hyoid. So if you can release the hyoid by grabbing it, grabbing the cornea between your thumb and second finger, or first finger, you're going to release a lot of structures attached to it. And then I'll take the trachea. And I'll release the tra trachea from its attachments laterally and inferiorly. Actually grabbing hold of the trachea, moving it laterally, lifting it slightly. And if I don't like the patient, I just press harder. <laughs> <laughs> Until whatever happens, happens. Now I take hold of the sternomastoid. Sorry, of the, of the sternum, yeah, the sternomastoid. I grab hold of the sternomastoid between my thena and my second finger. And I look to see if there are any points of resistance or hypertension and release it, or try to. And then I might drain the cervical lymph glands. And then most importantly, at some stage, either before or after, I want to release the thoracic inlet. Lifting the clavicle from over the person's second ribs, literally lifting it, using the arm as a lever to help, or holding down the second rib as the clavicle rises above my thumb, checking for any myofascial compromise beneath or around the, the clavicle. It's undramatic. Classical osteopathy is so undramatic. It is so unspectacular you cannot believe. Maybe that's one of the reasons it's been dropped. Where's the glory? Where are the sounds? Where's the drama? You bloody well try doing all that stuff on a sick patient and you'll kill them. That's why it's not done. No one wants to treat sick patients. So they'll kill them if they use what's called modern osteopathy. And now holding down the first rib as I raise the clavicle above my thumb. It's got to be done non-invasively. These are very delicate parts of the body. But it's got to be done. It's not a tickle. It's a damn firm but gentle touch. Please tell me when I'm running over time, because um, I can go on quite a long time if I allow to. Operator's knees, we looked at earlier. Use the support instead of the bed when the bed's too soft. <laughs> this is a particularly important maneuver because very often you have to treat the patient entirely on the side. 
It may be the only position that's comfortable for the patient, and it may be the only position because of the softness of the bed, and you can't access the patient any other way, that you can actually produce a powerful articulatory leverage. The sideline position is the most important position for, relactic, for relaxing the erector spinae. In the sideline position, the spine is most relaxed. And your most powerful leverage can be done gently in the sideline position in ways that you cannot do prone or supine. It may be the only position. And you may have to treat the patient entirely, a complete treatment, with the patient lying on only one side. Because there's a wall on the other side of the bed. And the patient's too ill to keep being turned around. And you've got to work out a complete treatment based on the pathophysiology just in the sideline position. So you've got to be very alert and very competent in a wide range of osteopathic techniques to be able to call on maybe one technique once in a year because that's the only technique that you can employ when you're treating that patient at, at your office bedside perhaps or even at your home visits. Again, particular centers crop up time and again in certain diseases. Now, in the hospital, again, you've got to adapt to what's possible, given the size of the bed or the height of the bed that you may or may not be able to rise, raise, or you usually can raise and lower a hospital bed, but the size of the bed, the curtains around you, lifelines might be present as well. Here, the patient hasn't got lifelines. Uh, this actually was a colleague colleague who was being treated by me um, in a very unwell condition with a double whammy. He had one problem, which is um, irritable bowel syndrome, which got so bad he has to be, had to be hospitalized for a short while. And at the same time, just before he was hospitalized, he got a foot infected and it became um, seriously infected and the antibiotics were not working very efficiently. So he had a double whammy, and he asked me to help, and some of the maneuvers that you'll see were practiced at, at the hospital bedside. You have to adapt your technique to what is possible, this is one of the most important maneuvers as practiced by Still. You can read it in osteopathic research and practice. And Little Jean, the founder of this school. How do you articulate and correct the neck without cracking it? Without producing any sounds at all? It's a beautiful maneuver. Absolutely gorgeous to, to actually work. And when you're treating an acute neck, in terms of an acute um, cervicalgia, it's so, um, the patient is so grateful because an acute neck patient is very frightened that you're going to harm them and make them worse. And the moment you put your hands on properly and apply this maneuver, there's a degree of confidence and they relax very quickly under your hands. Treatment of the anterior throat structures, we looked at a little earlier. Relaxation of the sternomastoid, we were just doing that on Ben. To relieve compromise of the very structures under the sternomastoid, the vagus is right under your fingers, as is the cervical sympathetic ganglia, superior, middle, and inferior. They're right under your fingers in the myofascial structures that you're treating. And you're looking for compromise of those structures. And here's the inhibition of the erector spinae. Here I'm doing between lifting up and drawing the erector spinae laterally against the weight, the dead weight of the patient. Understand what I'm doing? I go round the patient's trunk. I grab hold of the erector spinae medial, as close to the spinous process as possible. I draw it apart as I lift up so that the weight of the patient is actually assisting that lateral inhibitory stretch to the erector spinae. There was a lovely bit of research done in 2005, very impressive, on 
the patient straight after the coronary surgery. Okay. There's the research published in the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. Immediately after they had bypass surgery. <coughs> and the observed changes in cardiac function and perfusion indicated that osteopathic treatment, even when the patient was sedated and pharmacologically paralyzed, had immediate and beneficial hemodynamic effects. And the authors concluded that treatment, osteopathic treatment, has immediate beneficial hemodynamic effects after coronary artery bypass surgery. Degenhardt, another very important osteopathic research worker that you're going to hear about a lot in the, in the future. And his colleagues at the Still Research Institute in Kirksville published in 2007 a very important study, particularly for those of us working a lot with pain syndromes. It's a prospective blinded assessment trial showing that osteopathic treatment altered the concentrations of several circulatory pain biomarkers. Furthermore, the degree of these changes was greater in subjects in pain, they had chronic low back pain, than in the control subjects. In other words, people in pain are already primed. And what you do is going to have a greater effect than on people who are well. So it's very important, this point. It comes out in the study very beautifully. Treatment of pain is an important and essential part of the treatment of any constitutional disease or any infection. When you are ill, when you have the pains of a sinus infection or the flu in every joint of your body, muscle of your body, if you can reduce the pain through manual treatment, it will speed the patient's recovery. Anything that assists the parasympathetic side of the nervous system will assist the immune response. Anything that sedates and quiets, quiets the patient increases the, the efficiency of the body's immune response. And so reducing pain in acute patients, in acute constitutional ill patients, as well as acute syndromes, can only be of benefit in the speed of their recovery. Little John. And I'm going to finish this, this evening's talk. I think it's probably much more, pretty much coming to the close. Um, made a number of remarkable statements. I've slightly reformulated them. Firstly, that uh, spinal column and attachments are often the center for the expression of disease. He's very careful in his language, little John. Often it seems verbose, but he's not. He uses English language very carefully. He doesn't say that what you see in the spine is the cause of the disease. He wasn't that stupid even then, 120 years ago, with all the hoo-ha that was going on in osteopathy. He said, no, it is often the center for the expression of disease, that you will often find a somatic component that accompanies the disease, but it's not necessarily the cause, but it's certainly making life more difficult for the patient to recover. Another statement of his. Disease begins on the sensory, afferent side of the central and autonomic nervous systems. In other words, your first early stages of almost any disease is, let's say, the results of inflammation in a particular organ and the, the afferent bombardment from the site of pain or inflammation into the spinal cord. Let me just take you back literally a hundred years now, in 19, no, 110 years now, to these photographs. This is 1906. An osteopathic student of, of still, and still, still in, in these pictures, he's still in the background, he's still teaching in Kirksville, so he's watching these, these fellows doing this and producing these books. This is produced in Kirksville. This is Andrew Taylor Still's work. None of these things were being done by the author out of the top of his head. You 
can read about these techniques in Still's research and practice. You can read them in Little John's notes of his time with, with Still, and where he differed from Still. He is putting direct pressure on the vagus nerve. At the level of the cricoid, slightly anterior of the cernomastoid, you can actually put your thumbs on the vagus. Now, drug companies are spending billions on trying to have drugs that effectively influence the vagus. You've got a pair of hands that can do it. Now, every doctor knows you can do that because they're trained as students in an emergency situation where there's atrial fibrillation on a desert island. They can't get hold of drugs. They know that if you gently <coughs> massage the carotid sinus, which is basically also massaging the, the vagus, you'll often abort the atrial fibrillation attack. And I use that as an example when I have medical students coming around to watch what's going on in the, in the pain department where I work. And I have to explain osteopathy. I try to get them on my side as quickly as possible, saying, you're all osteopaths. For example, I say, what do you do with atrial fibrillation? You apply manual forces to produce physiological responses in the body. And that's all we're trying to do. You're doing it there on the most direct level imaginable. What's he doing there? He's putting a deep moving pressure on the tissues of the neck against the TPs of the second and third cervicals, and that's where you can actually almost be in contact with the superior cervical ganglia. So you've got the vagus on the parasympathetic side under your fingers on the one end, if you wanted, or you've got the, virtually the, the brain, the sympathetic brain, just below the sympathetic brain locus coeruleus in the medulla, but as near as you can get to the brain sympathetic center at the superior cervical ganglion, under your fingers, you can stimulate or inhibit, depending on the clinical, uh, clinical symptoms you wish to deal with. One of them I'd like to deal with is cell phones, really. Um, let me just finish, I think, with this one picture, showing one of the most respected and oldest of osteopathic techniques, and yet it's one of the simplest. Yet that has been done on more patients in the first 60 years of osteopathy to save them from critical situations than almost any other technique. And it is so unflashy, it is unbelievable. And if I had time, I'd show you it being done on a baby. It depends on how much time you've got. Um, you can't, well, you can have this mucked up everything this evening. It probably won't work. I wanted to show John Werner, who was Little John's closest student, actually practicing this principle on a, on a very sick baby. But basically, it's taking the erect, the spiny, ahead of your thumbs, the flats of your thumbs, never the points of your fingers in osteopathy, from spinous process to the TP of that same vertebra, which is one and a half segments above. Don't forget, the spinous process runs very deep and low in the thoracic spine and working from segment to segment in a deep, slow, inhibitory fashion to affect the sympathetic chain. How it does that? Well, I can show you the anatomy of that. Now what a future lecture is. It's basically affecting the dorsal, cutaneous, sensory, ramus, spinal nerve right under your fingers. And that nerve is your bread and butter. A dorsal primary cutaneous ramus. may have a picture of it. Thank you. Come here. Yeah, there it is. Look carefully. Let's bring the lights off. <coughs> Can we? Your monthly income even if you do nothing else except minor orthopedics, is dependent on this little nerve. The dorsal primary ramus, cutaneous of your spinal nerve. It's your sensory input from your hands wherever you place it on the surface of the body. And that nerve is your relationship to the dorsal ganglion, the spinal cord nerve cells and upward to the brain, and is your connection to the efferent output and to the rami communicantes and 
to the sympathetic ganglionic chain. That is all you've got, mate. So what you do with it is very important. Sorry, I'm going to start to get into hot territory if I carry on the joke. But that's your bread and butter, that nerve. So, let me finish this this evening is talk. It's my hope, sincerely, that awareness and dissemination of these and similar published trials will result in a long overdue reassessment of the current state of the profession in Britain, <coughs> and in Europe actually, and the tragic limitations it has imposed on its clinical responsibilities and its clinical role. If, as I have suggested, the clinical evidence of over 120 years, as well as that of published trials over the past two decades, strongly indicates that osteopathic treatment has a profound effect on pathophysiology and the immune response, as claimed by the founders of, this, of the profession and the founder of this school, then I believe we are conscience-bound at no matter what cost to our pride to admit our errors and begin the long road back to the study and practice of osteopathic medicine at the home and the hospital bedside. Such a road begins in the faculties of each of our training colleges and in the future programs of our postgraduate courses. That's where it starts, nowhere else. It only requires the will, the motivation, and the humility to radically change direction. And it's you lot, you young new graduates, very soon, that can either do it or turn your backs on it. Open to questions. Or abuse, <laughs> or bottles. Fire away. Anything, anything that comes. Can you switch the, uh, the big light off? The big, uh, start there. Can we want to? Just you asked about new graduates. I was just wondering what you thought that undergraduates could do to uh, advance the uh, osteopathic medicine in Britain. Look. Um, I'll be perfectly honest, I'm the president of a society whose aim is to preserve this stuff. There is a very active and growing <laughs> institute of classical osteopathy. It's based in the Metropolitan University in, uh, in Holloway. It's just opened, which is basically a charity clinic for graduates to come and work under supervision um, of classically trained osteopaths. There are courses being run all the time in this kind of work for undergraduates as well as postgraduates. Am I right, Henry? Undergraduates can also join? Um, it's uh, fourth year. From the fourth year, you can join these basically postgraduate courses and immerse yourself. Immerse yourself in the literature, in the studies, in the protocols, in the clinical work. It's all been written up beautifully. And have a go yourself on your family, on your friends. That's where it starts. I could tell you stories from my early days which are very significant as to you know, my efforts to prove this or falsify what I was hearing and reading. Or disprove, I should say. Try it out, quietly, slowly, under you know, a bit of guidance first. Don't just look at a textbook and have a go, necessarily. Next question. Does it answer your point? Yeah. I was thinking about the, um, the ties in terms of the uh, marriage and family and the family faculty and the colleges. Be diplomatic. Yeah. Don't be abusive. Don't, don't run them down. Many of them are just ignorant of this stuff. They've just yeah, never been exposed to it themselves. It's, it's just sad. It's just sad. And, and realise it's sad rather than, you know, well, not all. Sometimes it gets me. It's another subject. Yeah, it's
How do you approach patients from suffering from strokes? Gingerly. Next question. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a big subject. Um, one of the most important parts of helping stroke patients is re-education, uh, of teaching rather than treating. Um, teaching them how to use whatever skills are still available in terms of ergonomics and proprioception to regain some better use of their bodies and some better motor skills. That's a whole field in its own right um, in terms of, uh, of re-education. The use of mirrors is extremely important you can read up about it on the internet. It's not anything you can't learn for yourselves on the internet. Um, and you have to guide the patient, often manually, taking <coughs> the limbs that are affected and re-educating the proprioceptive uh, input. And then having them do it at home in front of mirrors that gives them the impression that, in fact, the, the disabled limb is, in fact, the, the moving limb that they're using in front of the mirror. It, it's a whole art and field. It's been developed very quickly in the past five years, <coughs> treating stroke patients. But you've got to deal with, manually, the contractions and the disuse atrophy. And that's where your osteopathy can help and make life a little bit more comfortable for them. Disuse atrophy and the contractions that inevitably develop with disuse atrophy. And they can be very painful. You can make it a bit easier. That's a question that kind of loud. almost some good news, I think. Um, having been a student here for a few years, um, I, I kind of agree with some of the sentiments that, that you were expressing. Um, and I, I can't, I don't have the extensive knowledge of the last 50 years of osteopathic history. But, but some of the things you're talking about, some of the techniques, and certainly some of the research, we do actually get exposed to. Good. Um, then and what? I think some of our, I, certainly myself, to some degree, Whilst we, most of the patients we get are minor orthopedics, as you've described, we, we do get the opportunity to see some, some fairly ill patients Good. And, and to apply some of those techniques. Good. So perhaps there is a bit of change going on. I hope so. Don't let it die out. Don't let it die away. It can be just a, a little spark that's become a light and can just disappear again. It's got to be encouraged. It's got to be fanned. And it's only enthusiasm that fans it. Okay, next question. Do most modern classical osteopaths still treat mental mental illness? I'm just trying to think. Those that I know may or may not. Look, if you consider the fact that at least 20 to 30% of our patients are hypochondriacs. I suppose we're all busy treating them <laughs> patients. I mean, <laughs> so, that's probably, that, I have no idea. Um, I can't say that I would be treating a mental patient other than in conjunction or in parallel with uh, a psychologist or psychiatrist. And I've had a few. Uh, some have been neighbors in the village where I live. A bunch of nutcases. <laughs> Put it mildly. No, they're very nice people, actually. Um, but you're going to see a lot of stress patients. And where I live, particularly because of the, the political situation, there's a hell of a lot of stress related diseases and the emotional aspects of the disease and uh, their treatment certainly plays a part. It's un unbelievable how an empathetic operator who listens to the patient and is willing to spend time listening but whose hands convey a genuine sense of concern for the patient produces a calming effect that may be sufficient over a period of months to see the patient through a difficult period in their life. And they'll come back to you because they know that it has an effect. It may not last more than a couple of days, so it'll come weekly. But it is far bigger than what we're doing just with our hands. We're often linking in on a placebo effect level, in the best sense of the word, to very deep uh, uh, supratentorial factors going on in the brain, the emotional factors <coughs> and the amygdala. So I wouldn't deny a patient who was mentally disturbed 
treatment, manual treatment. But you've got to be ready to listen, to be patient. It's not always easy. Especially when you're driving in that as well. Okay, next. Any more? Yeah. Well, I'm going to back. Sorry, ladies. Are you concerned that you're working with very ill patients, say, with acquiring Risks. Oh no, no. You forget about that. Just get on with it and make sure you're healthy, make sure you're well, make sure that if you do get an infection, you'll get over it quickly. <coughs> you just get on with it, like any physician in a hospital. You don't, you don't worry about these things. It's there, the risk is there, but you get on with it. No, no. You might wear a mask. It's a very good protective device. If you know you're going to treat a highly infected patient, someone who's going to cough all over you while you treat them, so you wear a mask. So, yeah. 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 We're regularly told both from inside the institution that the critics and the critics of the media that there's a shortage of quality evidence for us to What is it about the selection of papers that you've chosen to just now that makes them not quality evidence? Because they do need they're just pilot trials, because they're, they're pretty much pilot trials. The numbers aren't bad on some occasions. There are hundreds of patients sometimes involved. But if I really wanted to tear them apart, I could change this evening's lecture round and, and show you that, wow, the methodology isn't quite good enough there. But it's a great, great problem, just as it is in surgery. We don't have anything to be ashamed of in that sense. There are no greater number of controlled trials in surgery than there are in osteopathy. You can count them on one or two hands. And the number of placebo-controlled trials almost don't exist in surgery. How do you do a placebo-controlled trial without being unethical? How do you open up a patient without doing anything to them medically, just so that you can produce a strong placebo effect and see whether that's as good as the actual surgery that you're going to do? They've done that in a few cases. There's some very famous trials done a few years ago on the knee, where they had section of patients having genuine arthroscopy and a similar number, similarly matched for age, size, sex, and whatever, having fake arthroscopy where they were, they were um, put into sedation, taken into an th operating theater, all the staff were robed appropriately, a small incision was made so that when they came to it looked as if they'd had the surgery. And the trial results shocked the orthopedic professional. There was no difference, no greater benefit in those that had genuine arthroscopy for acute knee injuries compared to those who didn't and had fake. The placebo effect was often so strong in those that believed they had the operation. There's another even more famous trial, how they got away with it Helsinki ethics-wise, I have no idea, but you can find it on the internet, where they did full sprain surgery they opened up the head of a number of patients on one side and didn't do anything. And they opened up the head, genuinely, to deal with brain problems. And the results were almost no different in terms of the recovery and the, and the improvement of the patient's symptoms. But it's a big problem in surgery as it is in osteopathy. Because we have very great problems with sham treatments. The patients very often know it's not the same as a real treatment. They very often have different expectations, and they, they don't have the uh, same uh, confidence that what is being done to them is, in fact, uh, the real thing. So we have big problems in osteopathic research. Just one, one brief question for me. Are you broadly in favor of evidence-informed osteopathic practice? Absolutely but realizing that we have a handicap. That we can't produce the evidence very easily. But trying desperately, and there's some very good research workers, especially Nicciardoni, but others like Degas, who are trying very hard to get around these problems. But of course, we have to try to produce the evidence, and it works, because it works, because it works, <coughs> not because we think it works. But things like the pain biomarkers, when you can see a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines as a result of treatment, 
are significant. Is it a placebo effect? Or a control for it? And so on. Now, sorry, yeah. Uh, there were two techniques you mentioned. One was a spinal switch. You know, Rob was using uh, the cervical spine as a counter lever, and he said there were still techniques. Can you um, either demonstrate what the spinal does at all? Uh, can I demonstrate what? Either of those techniques, please. Do you want to make me work? <laughs> this many hours I've got my feet. Um, young lady, can I ask her? Would Bum like to join you here? Do you mind? Would you like to be a model? That's very sweet of you. That's very, very nice of you. Thank you. Come with me. Come, come. I want Mum to help. Is it okay if Mum helps? Oh. So, can I borrow a chair? Thanks very much. What I'm going to do, uh, I showed them the picture of a little girl that was on my lap, like swimming. Can I do that with you and Mum next to me to help? Okay, so you're just a bit big for this, but it gives you the idea. It gives you the principle. <coughs> so what I'd like you to do, it's like this, to go swimming on my lap. So just lean over. Mom, you can come nearby. Come down here so she can see you. Now, she's too big for this, but I'll try my best. Imagine it's a baby. I've got the whole spine, like a piano, under my hands. And I'm introducing flexion and extension. I'm still not doing anything with my hands. Now I can focus. One hand is a palpating fulcrum. I've still got one hand free. I can take a leg as a lever. Treating from the sacroiliac up. Is it okay? I don't know your name. Ella. Ella. That's nice. You must tell me if it's not nice. I think it would be very nice for you. Now it's a double leg leverage. There isn't a more powerful leverage in osteopathy. Double leg lever. This is still Andrew Taylor still at the BSO. I'm fixing on T2 and switching the spine up to T2. That's what he meant by switching the spine. Down to T3, 4. Down to T6. Down to T11, 12. Flexion, extension, side bending, rotation. It's all there. Back to the rhythmic oscillatory techniques of Andrew Taylor still. You've got an arm, you might as well use it. Look, it's a free arm. Ever, you can make it be very relaxed and floppy like a rag doll. That's beautiful. Look at that leverage against points of fixation. If you don't have fulcrum fixation, it's a waste of bloody time. That doesn't do anything. That's physiotherapy. Doesn't do a <laughs> Put your hand against the spinal segment and relatively fix it and stabilize it, and you will produce a profound physiological effect in the spinal cord and nerve cells at that level. It's all the difference in the world. I'm grateful to that statement to an ex dean of this college. He came down to the ESO in the 1980s to, as an external examiner, and I was there as well. And he saw students in the final practical exam doing all this sort of thing without anything significant with the other hand. And he said, a bloody waste of time just waving arms and legs about. And he was quite right. Because they weren't focusing the lever against a point of fixation that is millimeters in and around a segment, perhaps, or a muscle. And that's the only way you have an effect. And you've got a neck and a head, which we very rarely use as levers, but it's there if you do it properly. And fixing on T1 or T2, using the head and neck as a lever, I can work down to about T9 sometimes, depending on the size of the child. To finish, I'll show you with one more classic little John technique. Can I show them one more? Was it nice? What I need you to do, what I need you to stand here, Mum's going to be nearby facing me, and can you go on your, I'm going to give you a cushion to make it nicer for you, can you go on your knees on the cushion, I'll hold you, that's it, good, now, come up on your legs, come up on your legs, um, so your legs are straight, so come, come, no, that's lovely, that's good, 
Let me just take this out of the way because I don't fit that much. It's around the back of me. Come a little closer so that my knees can fix your pelvis. Okay, so now I'm stabilizing her from below. Now what I want you to do is around my neck to hold your fingers like that. Can you see that? Now look at this. Watch this. This is no hands osteopathy. Watch this. Pint of beer in one hand, <laughs> fag in the other. <coughs> and if I fancy using my hands, can I, can I put your shirt up a minute so that they can see your back? Thank you. That's very nice. Okay, hold on, because we're going for a lovely little ride now. I don't know what's under my fingers until I go through some diagnostic maneuvers. Okay, let's work around here. About T11. This is Andrew Taylor's stuff. This is Little John at work. You can read it in his clay clothes if they haven't burnt them or trashed them in the library here. Kids love it. But you've got the whole spine under traction before you even introduce flexion, extension, side bending, or rotation. And your fingers act as fulcrum, points of fixation. It's gorgeous. You can articulate from below while you fix from above, or you can articulate from above while you fix from below, while you stabilize from below. It's gorgeous. Did you like it? Really? That's nice. So let me finish on that note. Hopefully I've inspired you, if nothing else.